Good morning. I'm Dr. James Federici, president of the Historical Society of Hamilton Township, and we are at the John Abbott II House in Veterans Park. This historic house was restored in 1976 in time for the bicentennial. The maroon and white part of the house is 1730. The golden white part of the house is 1840. This house was the home of John Abbott, a simple farmer. His father built this home for him. He had about 800 acres here on his plantation. The Abbott family married into the Ivans family who built the 1840 part of the house. The Ivans family married into the Tyndall family and they were the last family to live here and moved out in 1968. The house is on both the State Register of Historic Sites and on the National Register of Historic Sites because of an important event that occurred in 1776 in the basement of the 1730 part of the house. We will take a tour first of the 1730 John Abbott House. We'll go through what was his front door into the keeping room or what people call today the kitchen. We are now entering the 1730 keeping room or what most people would refer to today as the kitchen. The most essential part of this room, of course, is the open hearth fireplace and the entrance to the beehive oven. This room was really the heart of the house. Everything that happened in this small home occurred here basically in the keeping room. If you were going to eat, you ate here. If you were going to read, you read here. You see in this room a wool spinning wheel to make clothes, so it was also a workroom. Over here we have a dough box, which would be used to prepare bread and other baking items. You would store the flour and the yeast in here. Once you made the dough, you would put the dough inside of the dough box for it to raise. The lighting for the house was candles. This is a candle mold in which you could either make bees wax candles or animal fat candles. The heat for the entire house was from the open hearth fireplace. There are cracks in the floorboards to the second floor that would allow the heat to rise. The water for the Kitchen came from the well, which is outside opposite the front door. This is an original beehive oven. It's called a beehive oven because on the outside, which we'll see later, the bricks, the way they're formed to create the oven, makes it look like a beehive. The oven was used for baking and roasting, and in order to operate the beehive oven, you had to place red hot coals from the fireplace inside of the floor of the oven and close the oven door. Sometimes they would actually build a wood fire inside of the beehive oven because they were looking to bake maybe 12 loaves of bread or several pieces of meat and they needed a particularly hot oven. Of all the items located here in the open hearth fireplace, among the kettles, the pots, the tripods, the trivets. This, I think, is the most interesting, unusual item. It's a toaster. The way the toaster worked is you put it down in front of the fire. When the bread was toasted on one side, you moved the toaster with your foot so that the other side of the toast would be toasted. In the keeping room, this is the most important historic artifact that we have. It is a pass given to John Abbott by the British in 1774 for him to pass freely into the city of Trenton without being harmed. 
The next place on our tour will be the butter room or the work room where so much activity took place. Here in the workroom, or butter room as it's better known, we have the butter churn for making butter. We have the meat grinder, grinding meat. They also would test milk in this room from the cows to see how much cream was in the milk. They washed vegetables here. They peeled vegetables. They also made soap and lard in this particular workroom. The last room on our tour on the first floor is the winter bedroom or what we believed was John Abbott's bedroom. This is the last room on the first floor for our tour. We are in what was called the winter bedroom or we believe to be John Abbott's bedroom. Primarily because of the fireplace which would have been very important in a house that was this cold during the winter time. After John Abbott died, his nephew Samuel and his wife and their children moved into this house. You see in this room two baby cradles. The name of the room changed to the Borning Room because this was a safe, warm place for a woman to have a child back in the 1700s. Before we go to the second floor of the 1730 house, I would like to take you out to the lean-to shed and tell you about its purpose. We're now entering the lean-to shed. The importance of this shed was to protect the beehive oven. We mentioned cooking in the beehive oven, baking in the beehive oven, when we were in the keeping room. This oven could not get wet, so the shed protected it from rain and snow. Also, the shed served the purpose of keeping the wood nice and dry for the open hearth fireplace and the beehive oven. The Abbots used the lean-to shed to store farm tools, such as these over here, the scythe, the sickle, the saw, and the shingle maker, which we have right here. This particular cupboard housing tools and household implements, we believe is the only original piece of furniture from John Abbott. This cupboard was found in the old Abbott barn behind this house. At this time we're going to go to the second floor of the John Abbott house. We're going to use the original pie-shaped wooden stairs. We are now on the second floor of the John Abbott house. I'm in the landing. The landing was a work space as well. Here you see a small spinning wheel. This is a flax spinning wheel to make linen. In the back we have a loom. The loom was designed and used for making cloth. This small bedroom is decorated as a child's bedroom. Child's dresser, high chair, cradle, small chair in the corner, and a trundle bed. As many as four children could have slept in this little bedroom. It's interesting that this 1730 house would have three bedrooms on the second floor, considering that John Abbott lived here by himself he was a bachelor farmer, so technically the second floor was not used until after his nephew Samuel and his wife moved here. You were in the child's bedroom. This bedroom is being used as an office, and now I'm going to take you into the largest bedroom in the house, the master bedroom. This large bedroom had multiple uses. This, of course, would have been 
the parents' bed. A trundle bed, again, could sleep at least two or three children, and then a cradle for a baby. The beds in the 1730 house, even downstairs in the winter bedroom or the morning room, were rope beds, as you see here. Sleeping on a rope bed, it would sag. And as it sagged to, closer to the ground, it needed to be tightened. This is a bed tightener. You would go around and tighten the ropes on the bed whenever it was needed. These mattresses, feather ticks as they were called, could either have feathers or straw inside of them. The more of these mattresses you had on the rope bed, the more comfortable it was to sleep. The beds in this house have antique quilts on them. This item is a bed warmer. You would take it downstairs and fill it with fireplace coals. You would bring it upstairs before you went to bed. You would run this over your blankets, your sheets, and your quilt before you jumped into bed. The potty. Every room in this house, both the 1730 and the 1840, had a potty. There was no in-house plumbing. There was no toilet inside of either the 1730 or the 1840 building. So every room had a potty that was used at night or during the winter or on a stormy day. The potty was then taken outside in the morning and dumped and washed and brought back in for further use. Back in the 1730s and the 1840s, there were no closets in homes, especially not in this John Abbott house or the 1840 edition. They would store their clothes in chests of drawers like this, or in trunks, or pegs on the walls. The reason for that is closets were considered rooms and rooms were taxed. So if you wanted to have a lower tax bill, you did not add closets in your rooms. The wood frames that you see propped up against the fireplace on both sides of the fireplace are quilting frames. These frames, when they're put together, could make a quilt similar to this one that's hanging here on the wall. We're now going to leave the 1730 part of the house and go into the 1840 edition. At one time, this was the outside wall of the John Abbott house. When the addition was added in 1840, an opening was created up here on the second floor and an opening was created downstairs on the first floor. We're now on the 1840 landing. The second most important piece of furniture in this house is the table over there in the corner. That table is a valuable antique. It's a game table used for playing cards. We're now walking into the first of two bedrooms in the 1840 edition. This would normally be a Victorian bedroom, but right now it's being used as a Victorian costume room. This room has morning clothes for funerals, wedding clothes, tennis dresses, night dresses, all of which were donated to us by families in Hamilton Township. In addition to the clothing that I mentioned, we also have a collection of Victorian hats, Victorian shoes, fur covers, fur muff, a Victorian feather fan, a child's red bathing suit made out of wool, and a Victorian doll that was donated to the Abbott House by a Girl Scout troop in Hamilton Square. This is the last room on the second floor. It's the second bedroom that's actually set up as a bedroom. 
Again, no closet in this room. Clothing would have been kept in a chest similar to this. Heating in the 1840s was very different than what we experienced in the 1730 part of the house. Here we have a potbelly stove, a Franklin stove, wood burning or coal burning to heat the bedroom. Each room would have had a potbelly stove similar to this. Again, because there was no bathroom in the house, people would have used water pots, soap dishes, and towels to freshen up in their room. The lighting in the 1840s was either whale oil, eventually kerosene. The beds changed also in the 1840s. Instead of rope, we went to wood slat. However, they still used feather tick mattresses as they did in the 18th century. Okay, we'll go downstairs to the last room in the house, to the Victorian parlor. We're entering the Victorian parlor. The furniture in this particular room is authentic Victorian furniture. Upstairs I mentioned that the card table was the second most valuable piece of furniture in the house. The tall case clock is our most valuable piece of furniture. The tall case clock differs from a grandfather clock in that it is wood front enclosing the mechanism. This particular clock came from the Layler family and was donated to the Yardville National Bank and the National Bank donated it to the John Abbott House. In this room, we have a Victorian organ, Civil War time period, 1860. We purchased this from a family in Groville. Above the organ is a rare Victorian piece. It's called a hair wreath. If you look at it carefully, it looks like flowers. However, it's human hair that was collected from different members of the family who died. Once the hair was collected, it was designed into a wreath and placed behind glass. Another piece of furniture that I'd like to highlight in this Victorian parlor is the melodeon. This is a mid-1800s piano-like instrument. The legs come off, it can be carried outside. If there was some sort of an event or a party outside, you'd be able to take this out as musical accompaniment. Two other pieces of furniture worth mentioning are the Victorian drop-leaf writing desk. Of course, writing corresponding with people was very, very important. It was basically the only way to keep in touch with people. And the library. Back in those days, people used their library not only to educate themselves, but for entertaining reading as well. An interesting feature of this living room fireplace are the cupboards that appear on both sides of the fireplace. There's one exactly like this on the other side of the fireplace. What these were, were warming cupboards to put your pillows and your sheets, your blankets in here, get them warm, and then take them upstairs to bed. We'll finish our tour by visiting the 1730 and the 1840 basement. standing in the 1730 section of the house. This basement is very historic. The reason why this house was placed on the State and National Register of Historic Sites was because in December 
of 1776, the treasury of the colony of New Jersey was hidden here in this basement. The treasurer, Samuel Tucker, was a friend of John Abbott. And Samuel Tucker asked John Abbott if he could hide the money someplace on the farm. Tucker brought the money out. Actually, he brought two types of money. He brought signed colonial money and unsigned colonial money. He put a trunk of unsigned colonial money in the attic and he put the signed money, which of course had value, here in the basement in tubs covered by broken dishes. They thought that the money was safe. However, a spy in Trenton, a barmaid by the name of Mary Pointing, overheard people speaking as to where the treasury was taken. So on December 9th, 1776, a squadron of British troops came out to the Abbott House, came into the house and searched it from top to bottom, did find the trunk with the unsigned money and took it, but never discovered the treasury hidden here in the basement. In colonial times, in this particular farmhouse, this shelf was used as a form of refrigeration to bring food down to keep it cold for a short period of time. The shelf is hanging to keep it off the ground so that the mice would not get to the food. Over time, amateur archeologists in Hamilton Township have donated to the John Abbott House, Native American, particularly Lenny Lenape, artifacts. We have here in these two cases the collections of George Sharp, George Mosier, and Donald Dilatush. We have everything from scrapers and axes to arrowheads and spearheads. We've moved out of the 1730 part of the basement into the 1840 section. I'm standing next to an anvil and an air blower and horseshoes, all of which were donated to us by a family in Yardville. These items came out of a blacksmith's shop that once existed in the village of Yardville. This yoke was given to us by the Tyndall family, the last people to live here on the farm. This, of course, would have been for oxen or large horses to either pull a wagon or to pull a plow. This Victorian dollhouse was recently donated to the John Abbott House Museum by a former active member and docent. Uh, he built this and uh, believed that it would be a wonderful display item for children when they came through on their school tours. This antique sewing machine, it's a pedal sewing machine, was donated to us uh, by a member of our historical society. It's from the Davis Sewing Machine Company in Dayton, Ohio. Here we have an 1800s canning and jelly cupboard. It was very common for people during the summer, the fall, to can vegetables and fruits and to keep them in the cold basement for the winter. This is a great place also to keep jams and jellies after they were made. Here we have a late 1800s icebox. The icebox came before, obviously, the refrigerator. What you did is you went out and you either cut your own block of ice and put it into the icebox. There would be shelves here for your food to keep it cold. If you were picking up the ice, you would use ice tongs. And at some point in time, there were actually ice companies who would deliver ice to your house. 
but you needed the tongs to move the ice. Now that we've concluded our virtual tour, I would like to invite you to visit the John Abbott House. We are open on Saturdays and Sundays from 12 to 5. Between March and the third week of December, See you soon at the John Abbott House.